don't know it's happening. So when I show you know my twenty something college students who are diehard hip hop aficionados and who are for the most part because it is brown, although we also have a black president. I'll tell you a story about that later. <laughs> but anyway, the black female president is extraordinary. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, my classroom is at least ninety percent white, which is not a problem. They're brilliant, they're wonderful, terrific young people, mostly progressive. It's this isn't, you know, Bob Jones University. But <laughs> but there's an extraordinary illiteracy about what the history of African American people are, is, what their representational history is about, and how it's playing out in the contemporary sense. Even worse, is no knowledge whatsoever about contemporary accumulated experiences of structural racism and their effects. So I have to actually tell them how we got ghettos. Hmm. Now they listen to hip hop all day long. They'll quote me lines like instead of papers, you know, I get songs. I'm like, that's very charming, but I need a couple footnotes. <laughs> and I, I would like to hear a book quoted, you know, including this brother's book here, which I've taught many times in, in a number of my classes. What do you know? Why do we have those? Well, I think they're just black communities where black people like to live. And <laughs> Right? And genuine. And yet there's oppression, the care the economic oppression, black people have their own communities. I said, yeah, well, let's figure out how that would happen. How is it that the South Side of Chicago got to be the South Side of Chicago? It just burst at the seams, so they just had to keep redrawing the lines, right? I mean, it wasn't about saying we're just we're going to uh, create conditions of choice. Of course, black folks might live around each other, but how and why and what are the circumstances of that formation says everything about what happened. Now, if you don't know that, then you think, as I said in the book, that ghetto is kind of a Disneyland, a place of entertainment. I've never seen so much entertainment come out of the ghetto. <laughs> commercial hip hop, dinners and outfits and parties and the streets are filled with money and every throwing money, burning money. I'm like, wait, don't burn that. I can use it. Why are you trying to use it? You know, just uh, it's a total fantasy. So, so what concerns me is that this post-racial idea is taking place in a deeply stereotypical cultural moment of racial ideas and representations. Coupled with, you know, so we have the images that are stereotypical and historically resonant with, at the same time, enormous illiteracy about that history. I mean, I cannot describe to you the lack of knowledge about what has happened and where we are now that plagues the United States as a whole, cross-generationally, right? The fact that the Civil Rights Movement was fought back viciously for the last 40 years and all of its legal manifestations have been checked and challenged and undermined and all of its institutional efforts have been uh, challenged as well, has also involved the refusal to a, pro, a, a sort of um, an anti-racist educational agenda, a literacy about race in the educational process that would craft a genuinely post-racist community. So we have these conversations where people can get on TV and say that we represent America and not be challenged, partly because this fiction and this fantasy has been allowed to be perpetuated. And the political voices in hip-hop and the socially literate voices in hip-hop, which is not the same thing as protest hip-hop, but just people speaking with a diverse range, have been put off the radio, and you know, Lisa's done extraordinary work about this, have been put off of the mainstream public comment. They get trotted out when hip hop's under attack. How many poor commons gets from Twitter? Right. Get trotted out, you know, when it's time to say there's content. You know, I don't see the brother too much, so there's a discussion about whether or not there's content. So the question is, you know, how can we make this moment really matter? How can we change the terms of what I would call, and I agree with Bill Fletcher entirely, a post-civil rights era brand of racial ideology that can reproduce a new brand of, of, of racial inequality, sustain the invisibility of white privilege under the guise of erasing the category of race, and put everybody of color on the defensive for asking questions about race in this new era. Woo! <laughs> Right? And it seems to me one of the ways we have to do it is by asking this, uh, to not assume this generational divide is the product of sustained knowledge and education, but in fact a kind of mass-mediated racial exchange. I'm not talking about the, the, the radical multiracial communities that exist. I'm, I'm, the reason I'm not is because I know we will. But I also really want to keep our eye on, as Lisa said, that elephant in the room, which is sh shaping who we are nationally, that's setting the terms of what President Obama can and cannot say, right? He's not checking the invincible before.